it is now my pleasure to introduce um, Rabbi Michelle Fisher uh, and Professor Sherry Turkle. Uh, Rabbi Michelle Fisher is the executive director of the MIT Hillel, and she is the first alumna rabbi of that organization. After uh, doing her undergraduate at uh, Princeton in chemistry, she came. To, she had the good sense to come to MIT and do a master's in chemistry before pivoting to um, study at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York City. And she was ordained in 2002. She's had served congregations in Potomac, Maryland, Walnut Creek, California. And she describes her return to MIT 12 years ago as the mothership calling her home. And she is um, a big fan of, of Sherry Turkles, has often turned to her and her research for advice and perspective as she helps students and her staff focus focus on building meaningful relationships in our increasingly and these days almost exclusively virtual world. Uh, so with, um, if you have uh, questions for Professor Turkle, uh, please put them in the Q&A feed and we will uh, do our best to get to as many as we can, uh, but uh, we, we will be ending at, uh, at 8.30. Um, so with that, I will uh, hand it over to, uh, to Michelle. Michelle. Thank you, Megan. Sherry Turkle, my friend Sherry Turkle, who I love having conversations and discussions with and have been looking forward to uh, this evening for uh, quite a while, uh, is the Abby Rockefeller Mose Professor of the Social Studies of Science and Technology at MIT and the founding director of the MIT Initiative on Technology and Self. She's a licensed clinical psychologist. She's the author of six books, including Alone Together and the New York Times bestseller, Reclaiming Conversation, as well as the editor of three collections. A Ms. Magazine Woman of the Year, a TED Talk speaker, I highly recommend you look up her TED Talk, and a featured media commentator. Turkle is a, Sherry is a recipient of Guggenheim and Rockefeller Humanities Fellowships and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Her newest book, which we'll be exploring uh, with her today, is The Empathy Diaries. It hit bookstores earlier this month. Sherry, you have written that after devoting a long research career to how technology changes, not just what we do, but who we are, you wanted to reflect on why you ended up feeling so passionately about your work. You want to understand how the person you are and your intellectual life came together you sensed a deep connection. And because you were trained in this analytic tradition, you went back to the beginning. You started your life with a secret identity, your real last name, your father's name from your mother's first marriage couldn't be said aloud. Your mother, wanting to hide an early marriage and divorce, insisted that you lie about this until you were an adolescent and then finally adopted by your stepfather. Yet with multiple identities, you still were required to find yourself. You wrote in your book, this secret was a burden. Just by uttering my real name in the wrong place, I could blow apart my mother's cover. So I learned to pass, but I always felt like a fraud. And I continue to quote from the book, The, New, the Empathy Diaries. This is what you say. The secret also made me an outsider. This was a burden. But looking back, I can see that I learned to use this as a kind of superpower, personally and professionally. Standing on the outside, I could see things that other people couldn't. I would learn that the normal suppresses what doesn't fit. I was primed to see things that didn't fit because I was of them. So I begin, Cherry, by asking, the empathy diaries, what made you write a memoir and give it that title? And why this big turn from our, all your previous research style work? First of all, thank you all for being here. And thank you, Michelle, my dear friend, for being part of this evening with me. It's always so wonderful to have a conversation with somebody who you know, really knows you, you know, and it's just such a privilege. Um, you know, that question of why a memoir and why now, you know, in fact, the Empathy Diaries began at a moment at MIT. I had just published The Second Self, it was 1985. And 
I had been named, that book sort of hit, not just because of its virtues, but because there was sort of nothing out there. <laughs> I was alone in making the point um, that there was a subjective computer, a computer that changed uh, how we thought about ourselves, not just what we did. And so I was a Ms. Magazine Woman of the Year. And also, um, while I was struggling for tenure, my tenure wasn't decided, but I was like very kind of famous for 15 minutes. I was also Esquire Magazine's 40 people under 40 who were changing the nation. And um, the Esquire reporter came to write a story about me and it was supposed to be like a puff piece something very sort of how wonderful I was because I was going to be like on the cover of the magazine. I, it was like, it was supposed to be like a really, she's wonderful, she's wonderful kind of story. So he says to me to say hello. So Professor Turkle, um, in the acknowledgements to your book, you thank your mother, you know, she's deceased. You thank your mother. Um, you thank your, all your teachers. Um, you don't say anything about your father. So tell me a little bit about your father. And of course I had one father who I hadn't ever seen, who I wasn't, whose name I wasn't allowed to speak because I had honored my mother's wish. And still, you know, you know, I was almost 30, had not spoken his name to anyone. And then I had the Milton Turkle father who I, I barely spoke to by that point because he had wanted me to drop out of college and come home and take care of my stepsister and brother. I mean, he and I were you know, not on good terms. And I say to him, well, I can't, I can't. I, I, you must just write about my, my work. You must just write about my intellectual life. I, I just absolutely can't you know, discuss my personal life at all like super diva. And as what he wrote in the article was, uh, you know, Sherry Turkle has a brand where thought and feeling are one. That was my brand. That was my, what I was pushing. That's what I was selling. And for somebody with that brand, you can't ask her a personal question. <laughs> and as he was leaving, I said to myself, it's over, it's over. I have to make peace with my story. My story is why I'm here doing the kind of work that I'm doing. I have to make this connection for myself. And over time, I'm going to tell this story. And so it's been something that has been a, a I've understood my work better. I've understood my life better. It's been, um, uh, it, but that was the turning point. And I picked up the phone and I called my stepsister and brother and I told them the truth that I was their step, you know, I, I did have another father. I picked up the phone and I called Milton Turkle and I said, I'm coming out with the truth. You know, I had all my phones and it's taken a while for me to be at peace with everything, but I finally told this tale. You. Previous books in writing had some personal vignettes. I mean, you talk about texting exchanges with your daughter, but this book, as you just pointed out in your first answer, is yeah. all personal. In what ways was this easier? In what ways was this harder to write? Um, in some ways, it was uh, a lot harder because I had to make sure that I wasn't, um, hurting anybody in the stories I told. Everything was checked and double checked. Everybody, I discussed it with anybody who was mentioned. I mean, I really, this was, I was ready to write this book because I didn't have any ax to grind in this book. I'm not, it's not a, it's not a revenge. It's not a story of getting back. It's really just my truth. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to write a story. I wanted to write a book that I had always wanted to read which is a book where somebody explains how their personal life influenced their um, professional passion. Because I know that in my case, they're inextricably linked because it was my outsider status as a child. The fact that I couldn't speak my name, the fact that I knew that um, there was another truth 
other than the truth that everybody was being told made me always think in any situation, there's another truth. There's always another truth. And I became kind of the Nancy Drew of my own life. And I became used to be seeing myself as a kind of girl detective. And that became how I approached my career. Um, but it was very difficult to tell some of the stories. For example, there's a story I tell in the book that I, I wasn't sure if it put my grandparents into a poor light, but it was so true. And I think it was such a, a classic immigrant story of, 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 of a Jewish family that had been traumatized by the Holocaust that I, I left it in after really agonizing over it since your question was, was it difficult? And it's the story of how I was the designated adult in my family. And not just because of my brains, but because of my family's anxieties. So when a, when a repairman would come to the house, for example, um, my grandmother would get all dressed up and my grandfather would get all dressed up in a suit. My grandmother would wear a dress and carry a little handbag. But I would be the one who would be sent to the door to let him in, to, to watch him do his work, to pay him, tip him, get the receipt. And there was something about the way they stiffly sat that had an echo of, not that rationally they were being, that they expected to be taken away, but that, that until there was no stranger in the house, they would be dressed and on guard and they would send their more Americanly competent huh. grandchild to deal with the stranger. Wow. And I've gotten so many, so much mail about that scene. And but I, I wasn't sure I wanted to put it in. It made them seem, you know, they weren't immigrants. They spoke English, but it was such a true scene. And yet, it was very hard to include the scene, but I did include the scene, and I think it has resonant for, for families who grew up with that kind of fear. So I did include the scene. That's an example of what for me was personal bravery in, in writing the book. You talk about being and just described yourself um, again as the designated adult. Um, if you want, you know, you can expand on that, but I also wonder you talk about this theme throughout your childhood of being an outsider and this outsider status that you had, how did that make you feel? Well, it was, it was not a good feeling. Uh, I was an outsider because um, one of the things to maintain the story, when my mother remarried, she remarried Milton Turkle. And as you said in your introduction, um, I had to pretend that my name was Sherry Turkle for, for a long time before he finally adopted me when I was a late adolescent. Um, so at school, I was Sherry Zimmerman, which was my legal name, but no one could hear the name Zimmerman, certainly not my stepsister and brother who had to think we were one family. So I would go to school with one name and as far away from my home as possible and then come home, hide my books. None of my homework could be done at home or it had to be done late at night from midnight to three o'clock in the morning. Hide my books that had my name on them. Um, and really be a kind of, I was always like an outsider to this Turkle clan, even as I was pretending to be in it. And it gave me the experience that I would later meet when I was, you know, the, the concept that I would later meet officially when I was training to be an anthropologist of what anthropologists call depaysement, decountrifying, being a stranger to your own situation. And the things you can see if you're a stranger to your own situation, says the anthropologist, is you can see that it's odd because you're not caught up in the game. 
So my mother was completely caught up in the game that I was a Turkle and it was no problem. And, you know, every little girl has her homework under lock and key. (laughs) Every little girl does her homework at three o'clock in the morning so nobody will see her name on the homework. I mean, she was completely into this game that was so important to her to, to maintain this fiction. I was not into this game. I felt my sanity depended on not being into this game. And so I saw my whole situation with this decountrifying, with this sense of distance. And I feel very strongly that, and maybe we'll get back to this when we talk about the pandemic and what I think our possibilities are now when we come, as we're coming out of the pandemic and looking at our country and what needs to happen next. I feel very strongly that this ability to step back and decountrify and look at a situation with fresh eyes was my heritage as an outsider, but really was um, a gift to me. And maybe it's our country's uh, salvation now that we've been able to step back and now look at our country fresh. Because it really, if you can do that, you can see things that you don't see when you're in the game. So it was, a, it, it allowed me to, you know, to see things, for example, when I went to Harvard, I saw the, everybody else felt things were normal. And I saw the tremendous um, discrimination against women, women. Everybody else thought it was normal that there were no women as professors, as tenured professors there, because there never had been, there never would be, there never should be. And I was like, I was like decounter. I was used to seeing things from an outsider's point of view, like, why are there no women, you know, and and so forth. I mean, I think it was actually, it turned out to be a, a gift. You talk about a gift and you say that, you know, ultimately you were able to see the positives of it, but that outsider identity surely in the book did not always work to your advantage. Talk a little bit more about Harvard and Radcliffe and what was it like as an undergraduate there? Well, I was definitely an outsider. I mean, I remember my mom taking me to the first day of school and we looked in the rooms and all the other girls had come up with trunks and they were like taking throw pillows out of the trunks and, you know, oriental rugs and personal stationery and quilts. And um, I remember my mother looked so humiliated uh, and I tried to comfort her. Um, but you know, for her, this is, was like, this is what it must be like to send your daughter to school if you have extra things in your house, like an extra throw pillow or an extra oriental rug, or we didn't have extra oriental rugs or throw pillows, or I was dressed all wrong. You know, I, we were wearing, we were wearing our best clothes, which was the clothes we used to stand on the steps of the Beach Haven Jewish Center on the high holidays was everybody else was in kind of chinos and linen and Talbot's dresses. I mean, everything. And um, uh, for me, Radcliffe was a place of, uh, of always feeling that I didn't belong. And you had, a, and until I sort of made a decision that, well, I was there Clearly, I was, I'd been chosen because of my brains, so I would kind of go with that. You know, I, I wasn't there because I belonged there socially. I was there because they wanted somebody, I, I'd been certified as brainy. <laughs> and once I, you know, and I sort of, I remember I, was, I went to Elsie's and I was eating a roast beef sandwich and I was thinking, I think I'll just go with that and I won't fight it. And I'll just uh, allow myself to just to do that and get more comfortable with this identity of, um, of, of that that is who I am. And, and somehow uh, 
maybe that's been part of my life story is that um, once I accepted that, a kind of burden lifted from me. And I began to really enjoy Harvard and make friends. And it was like, okay to be the brainy one because it was after all who I was. And, uh, and also um, I, in terms of empathy, I developed, I would say um, uh, a, a kind of self-compassion that being so much on the outside was very tough. And I learned to say, you know, this is tough. Be a little nicer to yourself. And I think that that's something that as I observe college students and teach at MIT and, and work with students, um, I try to say, I try to teach that. Uh, in addition to teaching my subject matter, I try to teach you know, the first thing you have to learn in, in, in this college is to really, you know, listen to how critical you're being of yourself and be nicer to yourself. Have empathy first for yourself. You say, you know, I wish I had you as a teacher when, uh, you, know, <laughs> as a, you know, at MIT as a student. Um, what I see at MIT a lot now is how many first generation college attendees we have. In fact, MIT prides itself, prides ourselves on being a first generation college opportunity. Um, and many of these students also say that they come and they feel like outsiders as you did at Radcliffe. In what times and places have you shared this aspect of your story with your students? And what role does the sharing of personal story play in being a mentor or a role model in the university setting? Um, how do you maintain it being the professor while also sharing your insecurities? Well, I feel that I, um, I have no difficulty um, in feeling that I maintain my authority even as, share, even as I share my personal story. Um, and that better be the case because in this book, like <laughs> I leave everything on the field. So, <laughs> um, so I'm really betting, I'm, I'm really betting hard that I maintain my authority. Um, but I, I, it's, it's always been my belief that if you speak your, your truth um, and you're not ashamed of your truth and your reason for speaking your truth is not, uh, is not to show off or is not to, uh, you know, is really to make a point that, that, that showing students who you are uh, does not diminish you. Uh, so I teach uh, two courses uh, where I share quite a bit about myself. One is about evocative objects, which is a book that I, which is a subject I've written about, where I use uh, the technique of having students read about and write about and reflect on the objects of their lives, the objects of science and people who've written about objects and the meaning of objects as a way of getting at personal stories, but also quite complex philosophical issues. So for example, in, in the Empathy Diaries, um, one of the evocative objects are the, are the good dishes that my grandmother's mother and grandmother bought her um, when she was a bride on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, dishes that I still have, that I um, inherited from my aunt, her daughter. And my grandmother would say, these are the only objects that I own that will outlive me and that you, Sherry, will own and that your daughter will use. And she had this sense that it was in these dishes that she would live on. And that meant so much to me for that she would feel that way. And indeed the dishes have had a journey of their own and my daughter, my magnificent child, well, you know, she will inherit these dishes and it's almost Passover and we will use these dishes on Passover and I'm just tearing up just thinking about them. Well, writing about those objects, I use them as an example to my students of what it means to take an object and have it bring you without getting fancy, I'm gonna write my memoir, now you should write your memoir. I mean, writing about those dishes 
brings me into layers and layers of experience and meaning and, and relationships and attachments. You know, I'm like, I'm, I'm in tears and I, you know, I didn't even show you a dish. <laughs> The second, the second uh, course that I teach where, I, where it's very easy for me to get into talking about myself is I've taught for many years, I've taught a course on science, technology, and memoir, where we read memoirs and, and autobiographies of great scientists. And one of the class favorites is uh, Oliver Sacks's memoir, Uncle Tungsten, where he talks about almost having a psychotic break after World War II. He's Jewish, he's sent to the country, he, his, 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 his brother commits suicide, and he really is losing it. And he visits the museum where there's a periodic table. Hmm. And the order and structure of the periodic table re kind of rivets him and helps organize him. He sees meaning and structure in that object. And so again, it's an opportunity for students to talk about what science does for them. And it's a way for me to talk about objects that have organized me as, uh, you know, in my life without feeling as though, you know, I'm sharing anything prurient or to show off or, so I think it's, everything is in, when you talk about yourself, and this is a very deep belief because I'm going on a little bit too long now, Everything is in the spirit of how you do it. Because I've heard you give seminars in which you speak about your experience and you, you keep your total rabbinical authority when you do that because you're doing it to make a point. So everything in my book, I think, is to make a point that's part of the larger book. There's nothing in that book where I'm just kind of throwing in a detail because I, I want to you know, say something about myself or show off or, you know, anything like that. I want to interject a question that was asked uh, from uh, uh, our audience here. Um, Karen Aronson asks, when you were at Radcliffe, did not you meet other students um, there at Harvard who were also outsiders? Or did you wind up just making friends with, you know, people like you from your social and economic class? Um, actually, there's a, there in the in the empathy diaries. There's a um, chapter uh, about this topic because people like me were put in a, a dorm, <laughs> a special dorm. Um, so the scholarship students, the students who hadn't gone to uh, private schools, we were put in a in a particular dorm, and. Uh, and then all of the scholarship students had a party where we got to meet each other. And at our 25th reunion, a group of women came up to me and said, we really want to talk to you about that party. Why do you think all the scholarship students, all of whom were in, you know, were in this dorm, which wasn't one of the beautiful dorms. It didn't have fireplaces. You know, it was really like what, an industrial dorm. Why do you think they felt it was important that the scholarship students know who we were, that we knew who we were? Um, so I would say truthfully, uh, when I was at Radcliffe, um, I was most friendly with other young women I was going to say girls, not because it was it's correct, but because, <laughs> because that's how I thought of myself and that's how we referred to ourselves. So I got immediately into, but let's, let's try other young women um, who were from the boroughs of New York City, not Manhattan, mm -hmm. um, who had gone to public schools uh, and who were there on scholarships, uh, were minorities or Jewish. Uh, uh, I, was, I never went to a final club. I never went to a party with a preppy. It was an extremely segregated. I had an extremely segregated, I shouldn't say other people might've had a different experience. 
I had an extremely segregated experience. Um, and yet, Sherry, you talk about that this whole outsider status ended up being your life gift. So can yes. you just take something and, you know, about how that unusual upbringing first affected you as a scholar? Well, because I'm able to, um, you know, one of the, this, this quality of hypervigilance, this quality of being on the outside and seeing small differences is really anthropology 101. So mm -hmm. you put me in a, you put me in a native tribe and I'm like, you know, you put me in a flea market, you put me in a, any market, a fish market. I mean, you, I'm immediately fascinated. Uh, I mean, I'm a, I'm a terrible person to travel with if you wanna <laughs> get it moving. I mean, I remember going with my daughter to a, um, a plantation in the South and she was furious at me because I was like looking at the different yarns the slaves used. And was, I'm like, really, I, I can be intolerable. I mean, I'm like, I'm like looking for, I mean, I'm, I'm very good, I'm a very good anthropologist. So it was, it, you know, I had a kind of sense of, 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 of seeing, differences of seeing uh, why were there no women, for example, in the experiments. When I would ask to be in an experiment where there were signs up, I needed to earn money. I wanted to be in an experiment, psychological experiment. No, you can't be, you're a woman. The, the, only men can be in those experiments because they were, um, um, done originally on soldiers. So all the baseline data is men. So you either say, oh yeah, absolutely. Yes, that sounds reasonable. That sounds perfect. Or you say, well, that's right. If you're part of the way of thinking where that sounds right. But if you put yourself out of that way of thinking like Carol Gilligan did, and say, well, that means that you have no data on any women in your whole theory of psychology. That's the kind of thing that I was primed to do. And probably it made you unpopular. What, <laughs> it really made me unpopular. So that's how it helped my work and the way it helped my personal life. I mean, your question was about my work, really. Yeah, about the academic, especially at MIT. Right. What are some of the questions that you were primed to ask? Well, at MIT, so that's what happened at Harvard. But that, but that, that example of women can't be in experiments because they, they were, they were the baseline was men. Mm -hmm. But then you have to say, well, actually, if the if the baseline is men and you never include women, that means you know nothing about female psychology, right? <laughs> but if, if 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 you're in the game, you never get to that later question. And then at MIT. Um, I was primed to ask questions about the nature of engineering that engineers just took for granted. Like for example, um, engineers wanted to create technical systems that were friction free. That's great for a technical system. But when it came time to make a system that people would interface with, they wanted those systems to be friction free too. But you know, if you're a psychologist, you know that, well, actually, the most interesting things that happen in relationships are when there's a little friction. Mm -hmm. We hate them, but it's actually when we get to know people and when we get to know about our truth and their truth and things can go south, but we learn what we need to learn. Um, and an engineer who's trying to remove all friction from a system says, no, 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 there should be no friction, friction free. And it actually took courage to say, no, I think if you're designing a system that's for people, you have to leave in that human, that space for human friction. Mm -hmm. This was a fight I had oh, many times. Should I tell my Bambi story? Sure, please. So Marvin Minsky is, was, <laughs> This is a great example of the kinds of things that you don't see if you're an engineer and things you see if you're a psychologist. So I became friendly with Marvin Minsky, who's a great AI scientist. 
And we went to the premiere of the movie Tron. And after the movie, it was a little cold, but he was, we were outside and he's giving speeches to all of his students. We're all standing around about the movie is great because the movie is just like um, his society of mind theory where the mind is made up of programs and the programs intersect and interact and their intelligence is emergent and on and on. And he turns to me and he says, children should see movies like this they should never be allowed to see Bambi. So I was like young <laughs> and I, I took the bait and I said, why not Bambi? Every kid sees Bambi. What's wrong with Bambi? I was young, I, I should not have taken the bait. And he says, because in Bambi, when the mother, you know, Bambi shows that you have attachments to your mother and it shows you that death is bad. And in the future, when there are the robots, there'll be, we will just bond with our chips and our, and, our, and our artificial intelligences. There'll be no death. And besides, the whole mother thing is not gonna be there. We're just gonna be taken care of by robots. And <laughs> I can and see all of Sherry's future you know, <laughs> articles lined up through that one conversation. Right. <laughs> And I remember later in life when I was buying movies for my daughter when she was little, I remember I was buying all the Disney movies and like when it came to Bambi, I like bought three copies, you know, so <laughs> there would always like be a Bambi on hand, but it's like always, it's always stayed with me. And all the people around him were like loving it. They were just thinking this was brilliant and he was brilliant, but it's such a good example of the kind of, um, of the kind of conversations I was in. Or people would always be saying, the computer is just a tool. Why are you bothering to do your work? The computer is just a tool. And I was like having people talk about their intimate involvement with the computer. And they would just keep saying, the computer is just a tool, it's just a tool. Don't study it, you'll never get tenure, it's just a tool. And you know, it was that kind of, it was that kind of conflict. Well, that's the long answer to your question. <laughs> You mentioned tenure, so I'm going to go in that direction uh, with yeah. it. It wasn't actually your research per se that wound up being the center of your, you know, tenure uh, conversation, as the case may be. Let's put say battle and a better, you know, choice of word. Um, you actually had a hard won tenure battle with MIT. First, they fired you before rehiring you, um, but that seemed to be more not because of what you were studying but because of being a woman in a male environment. Um, again, part of that outsider piece as well. How did you navigate all of that? Well, my tenure case, you know, I think was complicated. When I look back on it, um, um, I, it's very hard to say, you know, you know, th there's this concept in, in certainly in sociology and the social sciences of things being overdetermined. So, I was a woman, there were no other women in my department. Uh, at the time, I'm not sure how many were in the school. I mean, there, there weren't women in the environment in which I was uh, navigating. Um, so there wasn't like a, a group of women yet who were sort of in solidarity there to make, you know, to kind of working to, make you know, to help women for, who were having difficulty with tenure battles. Um, it wasn't yet a time when MIT was actively looking as far as, far as I could tell <laughs> to uh, hire or keep women. So there was no like, oh, she's a woman. Let's really, you know, let's see. That would be good to have a woman. So it was, that was not yet. I mean, that wasn't part of the picture yet, although it came, I think, relatively soon after. Um, not, no, not that soon after, but I mean, it came, that was not, that was not operating. Um, so there was no organized women's movement. There was no sort of push to have women. Um, and then by that point, I was starting to say not critical things, but I was an outsider looking at the MIT culture. And I wasn't saying particularly critical things, but like from MIT's point of view, who needs an in-house critic or who needs somebody who 
looks as though with maturity, she's going to grow into an in-house critic. Who um, looks like she's warming up to become an in-house critic. Um, so I think there's kind of a natural, um, you know, a natural reaction to kind of close circles, you know, to kind of close the circle. Uh, so I think that was the context uh, of my tenure case. And, um, and also I was in a department that at the time, uh, I'm not sure MIT knew that, thought they necessarily wanted to have this department. So they made a rule that anybody in my department had to be in two departments, uh, STS where I am and some other department. They made this rule like two weeks before my tenure case. <laughs> you know? uh, so I'd never heard of this rule until my tenure case came up. And of course there's no people psychology at MIT and there's no you know, sociology department at MIT. And so I didn't have a second department. And uh, so although I've been granted tenure and you know, I'm in my department and I think at the school council, when it went higher up, they said, no, she's not in two departments, she's, she's gone. And I got a letter saying I, was, I had to leave because they had deferred my case. My case had been rejected the first time around. They wanted to see my book, but my book came out and it was a bestseller. It was the second self. I was a Ms. Magazine Woman of the Year. I was one of these Esquire magazine people under 40 who were changing the nation. So anyway, I was fired because I didn't have two of these two appointments. And we got this letter and I was very upset because I'd written two books and a zillion articles and and I really had, was very invested in MIT. I mean, I thought that not only, um, you know, not only did I feel that I was really contributing something and had done something very unusual, but I thought that I had something to contribute back, you know, contribute to the place. Anyway, I went to see Francis Lowe, who was the provost. And, uh, I basically- I'm just going to interrupt for, for, to give me context again and remind me, what year is this happening in? 1980, uh, 1984. Dang. Okay, keep going. <laughs> and, uh, uh, 1984, and I said, um, look, um, you know, there's my work, which is, you know, it, it, you know, really is strong and, uh, very favorably reviewed all over. You hired me as a qualitative social scientist. Uh, and that's what I've done. Um, I've written two, I had written a book about French psychoanalysis that was very well reviewed and very, you know, before, I'd, I'd written two books. Um, these books are really excellent. Um, I've started a whole new field of study. Uh, that now is being recognized in other places. But let's not talk about that. Let's talk about why I need to be in two departments because um, I don't think it's okay to change a rule and make me be in two departments like on the eve of my tenure case. Shouldn't you have told me about that like earlier? And he thought about it. And then I said, Look, I don't think I'm going to sue because I can go someplace else and, you know, suing MIT is, I think that's going to be like a lot of time and, and aggravation, but I'm going to call the New York Times and have them do an investigation of why, how, why this woman couldn't get tenure at MIT and what it would have taken for me to get tenure at MIT. When they'll ask you, what did, what did she do? What would she, you know, there'll be some question as to why this case was faulty and why this woman who, you know, my book was reviewed on the front page of the New York Times and a lot of art, you know, what, what, why wouldn't you want this woman here? I said, I'm, and, and uh, then I'll leave, but I think you will get some attention to, and you'll have to answer the question of why wouldn't you want someone with this profile here? And I had a letter the next day that I had been tenured. <laughs> So that's my tenure case story. And I really think that uh, the lessons I drew from it 
uh, well, I mean, I drew many lessons from it, but I think the main lesson that I drew from it is that, of course, when you're fighting a battle, you should fight not on the deep substantive grounds, but on the thing that's easiest for the institution to say, yeah, that wasn't cool. We can't make, we can't change the rules on her, you know, 15 minutes before she's coming up for tenure. That real plus there was a man coming up with me who they put in two departments who got tenure. So it was like it was terrible. But I, you know, I think that the issue of choosing your battle, you know, not getting into I'm a woman and you're discriminating against me. I mean, I didn't go there. I just went to this two, this two department thing where it was easy for them to say, you know, you're right. You're right. I accepted their apology and I stayed at MIT. Um, but so I think there's that there's that general strategy of trying to figure out how you can ally with the person you're trying to work with. Uh, because I wanted to stay. I thought that I would have a wonderful career if I stayed at MIT, and I have. But I, there was something else that I took from it that I try to teach my mentees now and I've spoken about before, which is that because of my own background, the father who had never come to see me, being abandoned by this first Zimmerman father, you know, uh, all this father denial. Um, when instead of feeling, I got it, I'm a star, I'm fantastic, I felt so humiliated that I'd had to fight for the tenure that I just wanted to hide. I felt so ashamed that I had needed to fight. And so I think that in the end, I, I, did, I, I, I poured myself into my courses. I, you know, I, I, I just consecrated myself to being the best teacher possible. I did everything I possibly could do to uh, be a, you know, a really wonderful teacher. Um, but I really didn't join, you know, I didn't fight to join the MIT community, um, which didn't particularly want me actually, but, you know, I could have, I really didn't step up and say, look, now I want to be on a lot of committees. I want to do this. I want to do that. I, you know, I, I sort of, I don't want to say I, I, I snatched defeat out of the jaws of victory, but I, I hid mm. and I wrote my books. I did my work. I, you know, I, I, but I, I was ashamed. And so I mentor people now that when you get a, have a bump in your career, don't do what I did. You know, don't, don't be ashamed that you've had to fight for your, for your rights. And I think that um, because I couldn't compartment, this is a story I tell in the Empathy Diaries. I mean, I think this is what self-knowledge does for you, that because I couldn't compartmentalize my life, I, I felt ashamed that I had had to fight for my tenure. And I think that, again, in the reaction to the book, I think that a lot of people, particularly women, who've had to fight for things that really they should have been given, um, have felt ashamed that they've had to fight instead of, uh, instead of saying, well, that was a fight, but I won. And now I'm gonna have to fight some more, but hey, that's the nature of what's going on here. You know? And now you're fighting from the inside. I mean, one of the things that to me is amazing about this story is to me, you're the ultimate MIT insider because I think of you as what MIT can, should, and be talking about and doing. And then one of the questions that was asked by um, someone who's here tonight asked like, so what's your course number? Where do, the, where do they put you? And I started laughing as I'm thinking about this because you're still an outsider because you don't have a course number really. <laughs> Right, they didn't put me. So actually, so actually, it was because of me that my that the that the that the rule that you had to be in two uh, departments. They they didn't put me in another course number. They let me just be in STS. Yeah. So you get to be letters and not numbers at MIT, which is also insider outsider type of thing. Yeah. <laughs> right. No. So that was so. I mean, but there's really a lot in this story that I, I think is so, this was very painful to write because actually I'm, 
you know, I, I had, it had to wait to write this to make sure that I, you know, I wasn't mad at MIT because actually I, um, I think that because of my own, I don't wanna say my failings, but because of my past, I wasn't able to step up and not feel ashamed that I'd had to fight for my tenure. Mm -hmm. And so in a certain way, I don't think I've given MIT as much as I could. Uh, I mean, I've given it, I've, I've poured myself into my work and my work is associated with MIT and my, my students and years of students. But, but I think we both kind of lost. MIT lost out a little bit too. Maybe. MIT lost out and I lost out, yeah. So I have a different line of questioning that I want to you know, move towards a little bit. Um, Given everything that you write about empathy, everything that you write about technology, everything you write about communication and relationships, we've been through a searing period that has ruptured a lot of this. How do you see us coming out of it? Well, um... and, and I don't just want to say also from the technological point of view, but from societal point of view. Well, let me go back to my definition of empathy, which is a little bit different than other people's. Um, for me, empathy, you know, everybody's talking about empathy. Joe Biden is the empathy president. Uh, you know, he's so wonderful because he's empathic. People are, so, are starting to throw this word around as though it means like kumbaya. You know, it's like you just, you, I love you, you know, I love you, I feel you. Um, to me, I mean, by empathy, I mean something very specific. You. You, you put yourself not just in somebody else's place, but in somebody else's problem to the extent that you make a commitment where you're not saying, I hear you, I understand you, but on the other, but the opposite, which I'm sure you are familiar with from pastoral counseling, I don't know how you feel. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you feel. Tell me how you feel. It begins with humility. It begins with vulnerability and humility. That I feel safe enough in who I am and in my identity and in my capacity for solitude that I can just know who I am and listen to you and admit that I don't know who you are. Tell me. And I'm not going to say, oh, divorced? I've been divorced. Let me tell you. Da, 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 you know? <laughs> but, oh, divorced? What was that like for you? Oh, you didn't get tenure? Well, what? What are you thinking? How are you? you know, not, oh, I, here's how I thought that. You know, what are your thoughts? What are your, you know, really that it's, it's, hum, it, it, it's humble, it's listening. It's engaged, but it's committed because it's, and I'm going to stick with you. And the implications of what you tell me, as opposed to, oh, at the end we'll hug and we'll both feel good about sharing a moment. So politically, I think that the reason that people are thinking a lot about empathy now is that they are, they, they sense that as we go back to work, as we go back to school, as we try to heal our, our country, people have had an experience during this pandemic that has broken some people, you know, has really, everyone is broken in some way. Everyone has been traumatized in some way. Some people show it differently, but, but this has been amazingly difficult. It's not natural to be, what we've gone through is, is very hard. Mm -hmm. And we have to really learn how to listen to each other. So I think that, that, you know, that that's just one thing I wanted to say, sort of just kind of as a baseline, that there's something about learning solitude, learning to be comfortable with yourself, and then learning how to listen actively and in humility to somebody else, which is where our next step begins. And then the second point is that 
this next step has to take into account that we have been voyagers in a strange land during this year of the pandemic. We have seen America with fresh eyes. We have had this experience of dépaysement because we have watched things that we didn't want to see about America. We have seen racism and white nationalism and the Me Too movement and the Black Lives Matter. And I remember the day when I was, I, I, I turned on a television and I, I saw this stadium with, with cars, beautiful cars, expensive cars in lines. And I, it wasn't yet the vaccine. I mean, what are they waiting in line for? And it was these people who had never been on a food line before in Texas, filling up a stadium to get their first bundle of food from a food, in a food line. I mean, we have seen the inequality in our country and we have seen how easy it is to steal an election because it almost happened. You know, it's like there, but for, you know, very little, our democracy could have been broken. And we, we're seeing voter suppression and we're seeing things that have always been there, but we were able to not see. And I think that this other, that we have all been othered. We have all been othered as we look at our country now. And so I think that the, the story that I tell in the Empathy Diaries about this othering or this day pays mall being a, a gift, I think all Americans are going through it now. That's really my answer. You know, that, 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 that if we do it right, it can help us heal. Yeah, you say do it right. You quoted in one of your earlier books, one of my favorite Jewish philosophers, Levinas, and, and where, who he, where he talks about when you look another in the face, you wind up having ultimate responsibility for that other person. And what I hear you saying that hopefully this past year has done in the empathy realm for us is mean we've had to look in the face of other Americans. And so now can we take the next step as well of taking ultimate responsibility for their well-being, just as we take care of our own. Um, and it's so ironic that that is a philosophy that depends on looking at the face, whereas now we have to do that having only looked at these simulacra of each other's faces. I think that's so ironic, but somehow so apt. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, talking about the fact that like we've moved to this two-dimensional, you know, world. Um, you know, so uh, partly of what happens in the two dimension without having the actual face and the three dimensions and the, the person in front of us that we're looking directly in their eyes and not through a camera at their eyes. You write in your in this book and other book in your earlier books. Your entire theme of your you know, career has been aloneness, solitude, social media, the limitation of screens, the need for this face-to-face -face connection. All of that came up in the past year in the pandemic. And you finished the book, however, before the pandemic. So coming out, hopefully coming out on the other side now, I mean, I'm feeling like there might be a light as more and more of my friends are getting you know, vaccinated and my parents are getting vaccinated. What are the lessons that you've learned and how should the pandemic inform how all of us confront the future? Well, you know, two things have happened at the same time. People are very complicated. So one thing that's happened is that people have missed the full embrace of the human. That mm -hmm. we've missed each other terribly. You know, that, 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 you know, talking about the screens and Zoom, is like, you know, I always use the example that in order to, when I teach, I don't, I'm not doing it now because it's so, it, 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 gives me a, it gives me a migraine. And so I only do it. I, I'm, only, I'm only willing to do it for my students when I teach. But in order to give my students the illusion that I'm looking them in their eyes, 
which I'm not, I'm, it, it does give me a migraine, so I'm not doing it for you. So, but to give them the illusion, I stare at the green light. Do you feel that I'm looking in your eyes, Michelle? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know. But in order to give somebody else the illusion that you're looking, it's like, oh, I love you. <laughs> in order to give somebody the illusion that you're looking in their eyes, you stare at this green light and you sort of make goo goo eyes at it. And of course you see nothing at all. You can, mm -hmm. you can take in nothing of the other person, nothing of their body language, nothing of anything. Um, so you create the illusion of eye contact by looking at nothing. Wow. So the perfect, the per, you know, we're so dependent on eye contact and yet the illusion of eye contact, which makes people feel as though you're so connected with them mm -hmm. means that you're looking at nothing. And when I teach and I do that, of course, people respond to that because someone, people are so desperate for someone to look at us in this horrible <laughs> life of screens. And I feel so disconnected from everybody. I mean, here I am alone and now I'm just looking at a green light for two or three hours. And it's like, you know, like I'm in, I'm in some psychotic television studio, you know, at the end of the world, staring at a green light. I mean, this has not been good. So we miss, you know, and, and if you add to that people saying goodbye to their dying people, parents by, by screens and, you know, all the horrific experiences we've had, we really want to be with each other. That's mm -hmm. on the one side. On the other side, I get these calls from you know the New York Times and 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 news organizations of all sorts that everybody wants a robot companion, you know that that is like the and now there's this best selling book about a robot companion and everybody wants a robot. So um, we also have gotten attuned to screens, mm -hmm. and so we're coming out of this. I think, I mean, to say of two minds is not, is, it doesn't quite capture it. We're coming out of this with two sensibilities that really are at war with each other. And the, and the, and the place, and I, think we're, and I think this battle is gonna go on for, for some time. I mean, it's not gonna be resolved quickly, but where I am optimistic is that a few things that happened during the pandemic that I think have educated the American people in ways that I've been trying to educate them <laughs> for, I don't know, three or four decades and did not get that far. Number one, the next time somebody tells you that Facebook is really benign and they're just selling you ads and what's the big deal? <laughs> people, are, people finally understand, which is basically what Mark Zuckerberg said in his, in his first congressional uh, testimony. Mm -hmm. That it's just they're selling ads, that's how they make a buck. And the senators were like, you know, somehow the it, it ended. That is, I think people have finally gotten the, the whether it was the 2016 election, you know, the 2020 election, you know, more talk about surveillance capitalism, my work, other people's work. People have finally gotten that they are using you as data. And it's not just that you're getting great ads about the ballet slipper flats that you know you like at Ann Taylor that are you know that you just keep seeing in your feed and isn't that great? People have finally gotten some understanding of what's going on when you're online. That's number one. Number two, so privacy. Mm -hmm. Number two, the next time some software company, I wouldn't say Microsoft, but let's just say I mean, something like that, or you know, any software company says, you know, we have a product, it's on your kid's screen, it per personalizes their education, it's every book in the library, you know, it, it, it measures every keystroke, it personalizes completely what they're learning, when they're learning, what the pace they're learning, what they should learn, it, it, it personalizes the curriculum completely, understands their cognitive style. I think parents being given that option right now will say, you know what? 
give my child a person. My child, <laughs> yeah, would you please give my child a person? You know, my child needs a mentor. My child needs a person. Um, I don't think, I think finally the idea that what education was about was not like the best program and screen has come across to many people. And the role of mentoring, the role of being there, I think people have finally gotten that. So that's number two. So the, the notion of social media and its discontents, mm -hmm. that, that education is more than what we can just put on screens, and also remote work. I think that, of course, there's going to be more remote work than there was before. But I also think we've come to value what colleagues gave us. And we're going to really try to fight for some kind of balance um, with more um, information about what we missed. So that's what I'm thinking about coming back, that I think people are coming back with a lot more information hmm. about life in a digital, you know, life in a digital world. And are not going to be, you know, companies and big institutions are going to try to push things. And I think people are going to say, hold on a second, a, a totally remote? No, no, no. I think there are some things on my team where I need to see the people I'm working with. A totally remote, we're, we're going to re remote for my, you know, a, a totally remote life for my more, more technology for my seven year old? Mm, not so much. In your book, you spent a lot of time talking about your time in France in you know, the 1960s, and you talked about liminal periods. Um, I'm clear that we're in some, or I'm hoping we're in some liminal period now. And do you see promising signs, either from what you were just saying or you know, in new areas, that the, this game-changing year may in some way generate, be generative or healthy for the community. Yes, yes, I do. Uh, in some ways, I was trying to point towards that uh, in my last answer. Liminal times are times, I, I studied with Victor Turner at the University of Chicago, and one of the things he wrote about was liminal times. He called them betwixt and between times, and when old rules have fallen away and new rules haven't come up yet. And I lived in France right after the May Days in 68, and there, too, you know, old rules had fallen away, the, the new rules hadn't started up yet. And what happens during those times is people feel, uh, who am I? What kind of identity, who, who am I, who can I be? What kind of identity can I have? And, um, and I think that uh, I see, I see us in that kind of time now where I see possibilities for social change, for example, uh, where I think more people have, the way I'm putting it, has stepped out of the 4th of July parade and see this country with very cool eyes. I'm a very patriotic American. Uh, I was raised to think that this country had, you know, had been the salvation uh, of the Jewish people you know, with all the bumps and not taking, you know, with all the bumps and not taking in Jews and not bombing the lines to concentrate. I mean, there were flaws in the argument and, and anguish. And, but basically that, that, that we were lucky to be here. My grandmother took me down to the mailboxes and showed me how in this country, you know, the mail was sacred and we were safe and we could pray. I mean, all, I'm a very patriotic American, but I feel that people are realizing that you can, that now to be a patriotic American, you have to be disabused of notions about not looking coldly at the racism that permeates our country's laws and ways of doing things. And that is, you know, and that, and the voter suppression and the, 
and the uh, the police departments and the and the gun control. I mean, you know, I think people are really um, in this pandemic where it, you know it's not just that we've been in front of our screens and have watched it played out, but I think that the the, the kind of betwixt and between nature of the time have given people permission to think and say things that they didn't have before. Mm -hmm. And I think that from my point of view, this is a very healthy thing because even younger people, you know, it didn't even matter what generation you were in, had, had adopted conventional tropes about America uh, because there was a, I did a lot of interviewing during the Obama years, which, which in some ways were such, was such an interesting period because so many young people, and I wrote about this in Reclaiming Conversation, said, I'm so glad that Obama's president and there's nothing to worry about and there's nothing to, uh, uh, you know, be in demonstrations about or write about or struggle for, because if I wanted to, there's no private place to do it. And I couldn't get a job, it would have to be on the internet. So I'm so glad everything's okay. Well, everything wasn't okay. I mean, that's the point is that people had this sense of nothing to look at here, you know, because on some level they could not look, you know, and, and, and so sometimes a period that seems Pacific and that sort of, um, makes people feel comforted with a kind of superficiality, with a superficial sense that things are okay, things are getting better, it's okay, it's okay, can, can um, keep people from facing more difficult and deeper truths. And I, I, so I, I really believe that the difficulties that we face now in this liminal time, if we, you know, if we do, if we if we stay active and alert and empathic and engaged and patriotic and on it, uh, could potentially be the salvation of this country. Wow. Um, taking a question throughout the book, you write beautifully about the teachers and the thinkers who influenced you, from your Harvard professor professors, your French uh, psychoanalysts whom you studied with in the 70s. And you say you benefited from the experience of wanting to think like my professors, which in itself seems like an act of imaginative empathy. Is this what learning is at its best, enabling empathy? And is that what we need? I'm gonna add it in there. Is that what we need then you're suggesting for us today to imagine ourselves as the others that we might not have seen or experienced, be, you know, and interacted with before. Well, let me just say something about my, you know, professor and this wonderful question you ask. Um, I had a, and also this is a an, uh, something that I meant to say earlier. I had a professor at, when I was a freshman at Harvard named, named Eric Erickson, who um, at the time was a very famous psychoanalyst. He taught a lot of freshmen at Harvard. And uh, I use his theories in several of my books. And uh, one of the theories, many of his theories are outdated and outmoded, but there's one theory that I think I, I try to teach all of my students. I try to pick out this snippet of theory and introduce them to it, which is that, uh, you know, Freud was wrong when he talked about a linear progression, anything that involved a linear progression of stages of development, that's not right. That that's not that is not the way to think about stages of development. That rather you have issues that you need to face that you keep coming back to, and the phrase he uses is you come back to them with new materials that you have at hand later periods of your life. And hopefully, you know, at later periods of your life, you have richer materials that you can use to come back to these issues. So, for example, he's very famous for talking about the identity crisis. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you're supposed to have it in adolescence and then you go on to things. But actually, 
he argues that I'm having an identity crisis now, you know, uh, but I'm coming back to issues of identity uh, with new materials that I have now, richer materials maybe, more resources maybe, more maturity maybe, and I'm resolving it for myself in a different way, a better way, I'm getting to rework it again. And it worked, and in, in the book I talk about mourning my mother in these terms, um, because um, when I had to mourn her when I was 19, I had like no resources. I was poor, my father and my stepfather threw me out of the house. I, I had like nothing, I had very few materials. So I idealized her, I really didn't deal with anything at all. But later I had better materials and I was better able to come back and get to it. Um, so to get to your question, which had to do with, with mentoring, um, that's an idea that I try, you know, talk about what makes for a good teacher and what makes for a good mentor. I try to get that idea of, I'm your teacher now, and I want to get this idea in. I want you to do this reading. I want you to understand this thing about never being afraid that you get one shot at anything. I want to get, I want to, I'm going to, I'm going to get this idea across because I think it's one of the most important ideas in mentoring that I can give you. It's my gift to you as a mentor. Mm. And other people might say, well, that's an odd, <laughs> you know, that's, that's a little. <laughs> and I just think that the fact that I learned that when I was 18, I'm a lot older than 18 now. <laughs> and I'm telling you, if people walk away, if honestly, if people walk away from this evening and they don't remember the empathy diaries, they don't buy it, they, they don't remember anything I said, and they remember this thing about coming back to the same thing, you don't get one shot at a problem, you just, I will feel as though the evening was well worth it to them. And me. And the, the mentors that I had and the things that, that they taught me were much more about their relationship with me and, and things like that, that they had learned through a lifetime of scholarship and living. It was never like, oh, here's what Hoosie Watsi said about, or here's what God, you know, you know, it was much more a philosophy of, um, of, of, of scholarship or a philosophy of uh, thinking and, I'll, I'll just end because I think our time is kind of late. I'll just end with like what Barrington Moore said to me um, when I said, you know, I don't know, I'm a woman, but can I make a living as a scholar? And, and he said, look, you just, you're very good at this. You, you just try to study the thing that is closest to your interest because, and, and major in the thing that's closest to your interest because when bumps come and they surely will, you will have loved the journey. And that's really what I just try to communicate to my students, that it's the journey. Well, Sherry, you've taken us on an unbelievable journey this evening from your childhood through, you know, this past year, um, talking about how you grew and learned from your experiences and encouraging all of us to reflect on our experiences and how we can continue to grow and knowing that we can continue to, you know, not be stuck in any one place, but keep moving forward, that it's a circle that's a cycle that keeps moving. Um, and so I just wanna thank you for making sure this evening we were together. We weren't alone. We were, you know, our solitude from this past year was broken for a little while with, you know, being able to interact. Um, and even if my, you know, our eyes weren't exactly with each other because we looked at, at each other on the screen and not at the uh, little green light, um, we, we shared and we shared with the people whose faces we couldn't see this evening uh, who joined us. Um, so thank you for giving us wisdom. Thank you for pushing us to have the courage to act with intention and with empathy as we move forward. Uh, this was a complete pleasure. Um, so thank you very much. 
Um, and before I hand the you know screen over to uh, Megan and to Kim, I want to say thank you to them for being the backside of all of this um, and making all of the technology uh, happen so that we could have uh, this moment of connection with everybody. Uh, Megan, thank you, and again, thank you, Sherry. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Um... Thank you both for joining us. Um, thank you, Michelle, for doing a, a great job with all the questions. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the green light, can you tell? Um, yeah, that, that actually, yeah, I've heard the, yeah, look at the light tech um, tip before. And I gotta say, it just always makes me think of, of Gatsby's, you know, staring endlessly at this green light. Um, I'm thinking of people far away. Uh, we got a lot of great questions from the audience. Um, Sorry, we didn't. We did not have time to to get to all of them, and um, I'd encourage people. Um, again, the uh, uh, the book is available, and I did post the link uh, in the chat earlier. I will resend it to anyone who might have missed it. Um, it is also still on our on the MIT Club's uh, website, and a recording of this uh, will be um, posted to the um, to the club's uh, YouTube channel in a couple of days uh, when we get to it. Or when we when we get it edited, um, yeah. Thank you. This was uh, this was uh, fascinating and um, uh, very refreshing. And it was, uh, if I can just add my own little comment, it was great to hear that um, MIT students are not the only ones who sometimes have a complicated relationship um, with with the institute. Um, and uh, clearly, we all do love it. So uh, with that, I'd like to say uh, once again, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Turkle, for, for joining us. And um, thank you to all of our, uh, our attendees. I hope to see you at uh, future events. Thank you. <laughs>